Harry and I wanted to, to look at the, uh, how the, the status update and the, the model of the sort of the originally chronological and then eventually algorithmic timeline came to be and uh, where those ideas came from and how they came to be implemented in Twitter and then from Twitter got adopted by Facebook, Instagram and a bunch of the other social media apps. And so uh, uh, as part of that, there's a, a history of, of this evolution, which um, comes not from Silicon Valley startups, but it in fact comes from a bunch of social media or social movements and protest movements in the late 1990s and early 2000s that were trying to figure out how to build uh, their own media and build new tools for political organizing on the emerging web. And, uh, you know, this happens at the moment that we see the transition from web 1.0, which is Tim Berners-Lee's vision that's, you know, driven by static documents and linked data. Uh, it's very minimal and textual and data centric. It's the, the most prevalent thing we have now is, is media. And then it's, you know, it's replaced by the evolution of dynamic websites and user generated content and visual displays and is very people centric. And so starting in 1997, uh, we see the first implementations of CGIs, which means that there are programs generating the web pages as opposed to them being manually edited or created. Um, and the first dynamic websites are things like Slashdot, Open Diary, Blogger, and Six Part. And these, these prefigure the idea of user-generated content and the idea that, that people could post their own stuff. Um, and in the case of Six Degrees, that there could actually be a social network that you could display in this a map of, of who you know and share things with them. At the, at the same time in 1997, um, there was a series of activists doing uh, conferences and gatherings and they collaborated with the Zapatistas in Mexico and came up with a call for social movements to move away from press releases and move away from attempting to influence the existing media and create an alternative media and communications infrastructure. And so, in particular, there was a, a call by Subcomandante Marcos that said that new alternative tools need to be built. And that was picked up by the Direct Action Media Network and Dow and Deep Dish Television and Free Speech TV and, and a number of other groups. Um, and in 1999, uh, as part of the WTO protests in Seattle, uh, this coalition came together and launched something called Indie Media, which was the, the first time that in the context of a protest or in the context of many users, there was a way in which people could post uh, video, photo, text, um, do web streaming for, uh, for live radio, and also do live streaming of video from a protest in the streets. And so, you know, before there were cell phone cameras and before there was a cell phone data network, uh, this, this group of activists were, were modeling how these behaviors happen. And now uh, every protest you see has half the people have their phones up streaming stuff. And it's, it's how we understand what's happening. Um, and in this paper, we wanna talk about how things went from indie media to a, a platform called TextMob and into a company called Odeo, which is a podcasting startup that created Twitter. As you can see, back in 1999, uh, Indie Media modeled this idea of many users can contribute status updates and then it would send it out to people, but this was exclusively on the web. By 2004, this same group of, of technologists and activists had started figuring out how to use mobile phones, which were more ubiquitous, 
as a platform for collecting and sharing and consuming. Uh, so what became social media, short status updates. Um, and uh, in 2004, this system was launched with about 4,400 users delivering at a peak of 40,000 messages per hour of, of users who were sending what we would now think of as tweet status updates about what was going on at the protests. And so some of these were to small groups and some of these were broadcast to uh, several thousand users at a time. And they were simultaneously sent to people's phones and sent online. So that led up to a, a time in which a San Francisco startup called Odeo was founded and, and Odeo uh, created a lot of what becomes podcasting and is mostly known because it is the company that created Twitter. And to understand where it came from, the Odeo team was half people who had quit working on Blogger at Google and the other half were the indie media activists who had uh, built this status update system and this text message system. So, but Odeo wasn't attempting to do status updates. It wasn't attempting to do what we consider social media. It was attempting to do podcasting and uh, failed at that because it went in, up against Apple, which had vertical integration between iTunes and the iPod. And so the company uh, basically did a series of hackathons looking at everything that they had worked on in the past and models. And it was, through those hackathons that the company decided to combine what they learned from blogging, what they learned from uh, dispatch messaging systems and what came out of indie media and text mob to build a, a status update system that worked over cell phones, combined RSS and a website for readers. And that's, that's where we get this model of where Twitter comes from. It, it comes from several different distinct technologies that were developed uh, over the web in the late 90s and early 2000s that were combined in a unique way. Um, the, what we can learn from this is that, that you know, the technology doesn't determine the social processes, nor does it determine how social change will happen, but Technology creates the possibility and facil to facilitate change to the extent that social movements are using these technologies. But it's not, it's not self-evident that this technology is deterministic. You know, the original use cases and values of indie media and text mob <clears throat> were built into the affordances of those systems and through that ended up as part of Twitter. And so it's no surprise that Twitter itself uh, supported vast social movements like the Arab Spring or Black Lives Matter or the alt-right uh, that supported the election of Trump. It's because though it was designed in that way to be able to support it. Um, what, what we need to think about is that the way technology encodes values and it doesn't necessarily even have to be values that the creators understand they're encoding. The, the, not everyone at Odeo understood the values behind indie media, but they did use the software, analyze the software and figure out how they could build on top of it. You know, indie media, you know, then Twitter had the combination of the social values and the technological values and the way in which markets and venture capital decided. it. And so it transitioned from an open network that actually operated over XMPP in a federated way to a closed model that eventually shut down the open API in a bid to prevent market takeover and to build a business model around advertising. Um, you know, all sorts of movement ideologies have, have found a way to use this because it it is particularly useful for bringing people together. In conclusion, the, the Silicon Valley model says that there are heroes and founders who create these things. But if we look at the history of these technologies and all of the papers that we've heard presented in the session, it's about, it's about communities of practice 
that come together to create these things. Um, social movements have always been early adopters of these uh, technologies. If you look at the uh, Protestant movement adopting the printing press to print the Bible in vernacular languages and pamphlets to the adoption of radio um, and television. And the social movements, as they adopt this, they haven't failed. They just shifted the, 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 the political space. And so what, what we see is going forward is that social movements will continue to be early adopters and continue to shape things and influence the values of them. And we see that as a, a major set of debates going on right now as Elon Musk takes over Twitter and then we define what, what should be free speech, what should be moderation, what is acceptable on these timelines, what technological affordances should these systems have now that they've gone from 4,000 people receiving 40,000 messages an hour to hundreds of millions of people receiving messages every day and it defining the entire news cycle. So um, that's a bit of the origin of, of how the status update came to be. Uh, after it was adopted by Twitter, Facebook, which had no timeline and feed, adopted a status update. Uh, Instagram was created by one of the early employees at Twitter. And so it itself adopted much of those, those affordances, even if they didn't understand the history. Um, we go into more detail in the paper um, and uh, I know we're running out of time, so I wanna wrap it up.